Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on moviehousememories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. You're listening to Lunchtime Movie Review from lunchtimemoviereview.com, and we are the children of the 80s. Back to the lunchtime movie review, where we review the movies from our childhood. Uh, I'm Matt. I'm Jason. I'm Greg. And I'm Patrick. And we're bringing you another movie from the 80s. And Jason has our movie this week, but first, a word from our sponsor. Yes, today's podcast is brought to you by Rolls-Royce, the Corniche Convertible, a $5,000 grill, and luxurious enough to stow a passed-out, drunken, wicked hottie. Voted by Car and Driver as the best car in which to commit date rape. Rolls-Royce, trusted to deliver excellence. I wish I could afford a Rolls-Royce. Sounds nice. (laughs) I would would prefer the passed out hottie. Today we're going back to 1984 with the classic teen movie, 16 Candles. Woo! Woo! I've I've been looking forward to this one. (laughs) <laughs> we took a, a weird turn there with Matt, but we'll get back on track. I thought everyone was going to share my enthusiasm with 16 Candles. For those who haven't seen 16 Candles in a long time, it's it's one of those John Hughes movies, and it's, I think, the first of his really great teen movies. Give you a little refresher of what this movie is really about. Wait a minute, real quick. Before that, though, he did do Vacation. He did do Vacation. National Lampoon's Vacation. He wrote it. Right. He didn't direct. This, this is the first one he directed. Yeah, this is his first directorial, yeah. directorial effort. All right, all right. He wrote Mr. Mom too. Oh, he did write Mr. Mom, and Mr. which Mom. is one of your favorites. It is one. Of, I love Mr. Mom. That's HBO did it for me with Mr. Mom. Were we trying to correct myself when I said this is the first of his teen movies? Is that no, why we no, went back I just to thought we provided Mr. Mom. I thought we provide context to show what else he was involved with that he wasn't. He didn't only do teen movies, which is what he's most well known for. He did do Mr. Mom, did Vacation, or at least wrote them. So he was usually involved in all the vacations. Yeah, and European Vacation and Christmas Vacation. Yeah, I, know I, that I don't think he's touting that uh, European Vacation. Maybe not Vegas Vacation, but at least one day we'll find his grave and etch in he wrote European <laughs> Vacation, and people won't feel so bad that he died anymore. Little known fact is they made Vegas Vacation to make European Vacation look better. <laughs> they succeeded barely. 16 Candles deals with uh, Samantha's 16th birthday, and it takes place uh, on that day, but unfortunately, none of her family remembers because they're too occupied with her older sister's wedding, which is going to take place on the next day. Uh, Samantha believes that all of her her troubles and her life are going to change miraculously uh, when she turns 16, Uh, namely that she'll develop a body in order to attract the attention of a high school senior named Jake Ryan. Now, Jake Ryan's also a wrestler that poses as an Indian, and I mean feather, not dot. Samantha believes that Jake doesn't even know he exists. Jake, on the other hand, secretly finds Samantha attractive and is looking for a way to break up with his very developed girlfriend, Carolyn. Boing. Samantha does have one admirer. He's a freshman geek named Farmer Ted. Farmer Ted has a reputation as a ladies' man, and he earned this in sixth grade, and he intends on keeping it. On the night of Samantha's birthday, she decides to go to the school dance. However, before she goes, she's talked into taking along her grandparents' Asian slave by the name of Long Duck Dong. At the dance, Farmer Ted bet Lloyd Dobler that he can score with Samantha. Farmer Ted bets 12 floppy discs. And I had to look up what a floppy disk was. I guess it's some sort of primitive computer storage device. Uh, I I don't really know. That's as far as I got. Apparently, they were really expensive in 84. As proof, uh, Farmer Ted has to get Samantha's panties. 
Farmer Ted tries to dance with Samantha, but Samantha gets upset because she has an awkward encounter with Jake, and she runs off to the shop class. Again, I had to look up what shop class was because apparently they don't exist anymore. Well, shop class comes right usually at the same time as band. Oh, is that what you were doing then? Shop? No, I was in choir. Farmer Ted follows her in there, and while they're in there, they share secrets about themselves. Farmer Ted tells Samantha that he's never really made it with a girl, and he also informs her that Jake Ryan has a crush on her. Uh, Samantha is so happy that she agrees to loan Farmer Ted her panties for ten minutes. Samantha then approaches Jake at the dance, but has another awkward encounter and goes home. Meanwhile, Long Duck Dong decides to hit the town with his new American girl. Uh, she's known in this movie simply as the Lumberjack. Jake's girlfriend, Caroline, unbeknownst to Jake, has planned a very huge party at Jake's house. Farmer Ted ends up attending, but Carolyn, she gets drunk and she basically coordinates trashing Jake's house. She ends up passing out in one of the rooms. Farmer Ted and Jake begin talking at this party, and Farmer Ted tells Jake that Samantha likes him. Jake decides to trade Carolyn and a Rolls Royce for Samantha's panties. Now, this is a business transaction only a Japanese businessman would truly appreciate. Farmer Ted agrees to take a drunk, horny Carolyn to Lloyd Dobler's house to get some photographic <laughs> proof that he scored with the, palm, with the prom queen. Later, he loses his virginity for real in the parking lot with Carolyn, who ends up falling in love with this geek. Long Duck Dong ends up crashing the family car I know what a surprise there after getting drunk Samantha attends her sister's wedding and then after the ceremony she's walking out of the church and she sees Jake who is waiting for her Jake takes Samantha back to his house to celebrate her 16th birthday and what does he give her as a present her panties sweet that is 16 candles very nice when you think about it now at least when we decided to review this movie. In my mind, it was always a big film. I thought that this made a lot of money, and it was very, very popular. Am I wrong, Patrick? No, you're, it was absolutely not that big of a hit. I mean, it was the 44th highest-grossing film of that year, made just short of $24 million, just above Missing in Action, Oh God, You Devil, and Rhinestone. It was down there with what we would traditionally consider bombs Wait, in this did, day. It did worse than Rhinestone. No, no, it just did slightly oh, better just than slightly better. <laughs> slightly better. It did. It did worse than. Well, it did worse than Nightmare on Elm Street, which actually was surprised because I thought that was a bigger film. But uh, Moscow on the Hudson, The Flamingo Kid, The Woman in Red were the, some of the movies just above it as far as gross that year. But it wasn't that big of a hit. But it was the competition. If you look back at it at now, it was that was the time that The Natural came out. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, Ghostbusters, Gremlins, Star Trek Three, Friday the 13th Part 4, which was actually a big series at the time, and, of course, the classic Breakin'. So, and those Breakin'. all made... More money. Much more money. Well, Ghost must, Ghostbusters is the, the number one film that year. No. Beverly Hills Cop. Beverly Hills Cop. Beverly Hills Cop. You know, it, it, we were the target audience. Yeah, I mean, it is a quintessential teen 80s, 80s movie film. and a quintessential... John Hughes teen film that that when when you talk 80s movies when you talk teen movies this is one that's coming up one of the appeals to this movie are are the characters that are in it and watching it uh, this last time um, I asked myself were these actors good picks for the parts they were playing let's start with the star Anthony Michael Hall the female star uh, of Molly Ringwald I think she was a good pick for this. I don't think she's a terrifically gifted actress, but for this role and this part, I thought she did a a, a very good job. Well, I find her believable this, as a 16-year-old girl, yes. And she was she was 16. She was unlike some of the other That's uh, what makes it hot. Actors. She was 16. <laughs> the other adult. <laughs> but before this, she didn't she hadn't been a lot. She was in uh the probably Facts of Life was probably her biggest. Yeah. She was in Space Hunter. Role. What are you talking about? Space, Space Hunter, Hunter. 1983. <laughs> She had the bit part on Different Strokes, which then went to... Different uh, Strokes or Facts of Life? She was initially in Different Strokes. And it went on to Facts of Life. And then she went on to Facts of Life. But Facts of Life is a spinoff of Different Strokes, so it makes sense. Right, because of Mrs. Garrett. Right. But but, but this was really her first first film, and it's a big one for 
for what it is. I mean, as as being a lead and and uh, part, but yeah, I think thought she was good. She's quirky, you know. She's kind of that. Another little known fact: the last time she acted with an African American on on film was Different Strokes, <laughs> and she does highlight that in the film. She she does not want to date a black guy. What are you talking about? Just in the film. Yeah, it's the beginning, very beginning with her friend. I, I think it's Randy, her girlfriend, and Molly Ringwald. Samantha's t- talking about her ideal 16th birthday, how she had dreamed about it. A black guy? No, a black trans am. It did not involve a black man. That's exactly what she says. Or getting herpes. It was pretty pretty dark stuff right there. These 16-year-old girls talking about not being with a black man and not getting herpes. That's they go they're... hand in hand. <laughs> Apparently to them. In 1984, um, innocuous. I guess in the Chicago area, suburbia. Yeah, rich areas of Chicago, you got to avoid those two things. <laughs> but no, I thought I thought Molly Ringwald was was good in this. She's believable in this character, where she's the unassuming kind of nerdy. <laughs> my my seven year old loves the line uh, where Jake's doing pull ups with her his friend, and he says he's sort of doing pull ups. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a funny bet, but this friend says maybe she's retarded. I mean, that's, <laughs> she plays a pretty good. Girl that the, the the jocks and the cool kids would think maybe she's a little retarded. I don't really like using the R word on the podcast. Me neither, but I'm re- I'm repeating what, repeating was, said what the, was said in the film. She's awkward. Like yeah, a lot she, of teenagers. She plays that role well. It's the same kind of a similar role she plays in um, Pretty in Pink. Much more believable in those types of roles than she is as the princess in Breakfast Club. We all agree that she's a, she's a good pick for this. She's all right. Yeah. 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 Now better than Ali to- Sheedy. Right. Moving on, better than Alashidi, who was up for the part. As yeah, a matter she just beat her up. Right. So, who I, I don't think would have played it nearly as well. History would have rewrote itself now that Molly Ringwald would star in Short Circuit. <laughs> <laughs> but Michael Anthony Hall. I think Michael or Anthony, Anthony Hall. Michael Hall. What I say? The actor is no. <laughs> I only go with two names. That's only. <laughs> I'll commit to two names. He can be Michael Hall, Anthony Hall, Anthony Michael, or Michael Anthony. It's One Anthony of the- Michael Hall. <laughs> Anthony Michael Hall. Anthony Hit, Michael Hall is great. Hits in this it film. out of the park. He is uh, laugh out loud funny uh, he, in this film. He should have pulled a George Costanza after doing this performance. He should have said, "Out, I'm done," and and he would be mythical. Unfortunately, he does Johnny B. Good. Well, that was a couple films later. He was good in Breakfast Club. He was he's good. Okay, in, in, he, he was Breakfast okay Club. in Weird Science, but no, I like Breakfast. I thought he was good in Breakfast Club. So. Okay. But he he truly embraces geekdom. No. In this, no, you know, no, he, he 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 relishes in it. Where in Breakfast Club, he's the smart kid, but he doesn't right. play it. Breakfast Club's more of a nerd, right? Like the kind of smart guy who's an outcast. This is geek, yes, right? Because he's he's the cool, tough kid with his group, yeah. but everywhere else, he's the biggest dork. He's the motorcycle spaz. rider yeah. in the moped gang, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, before this, he's in uh, Vacation as well, which he's great in. He's fine. I mean, it's just kind of understood because it's not really his. Doesn't sure. pull a lot in. But and then his six pack, which is classic one of, six pack. Classic six pack. It's a great, great film where he plays Doc, the the wizard with the uh, with an engine. I love that you reference six pack as a great <laughs> film. Fish called Wanda. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> if both are playing at the same time, I know where I'm going, and it's six pack. Diane Lane, come on. I can't see mm-hmm. Farmer Ted. On screen without starting to laugh, um, he has some gr- just some great lines in this movie. And the delivery is perfect. The delivery is perfect when he is talking to Samantha at the dance on the bleachers. So he tries to dance with her, and he's doing that very hot, very hot. She walks away. He tracks her down when she's sitting on the bleachers with two of her friends, and the exchange during that part is just classic to me. It's it's very funny and. Uh, I, I like to say, I, I think I've had those exchanges in high school and lucky to live to tell about them, uh, but it hit home on a personal note. Yeah. So you're reliving your high school moment? That Oh, I remember when I did that. <laughs> right. For 12 floppies and a pair of panties. He, do, he does have really some, some funny things going on in the film because as he's kind of a geek on, on the one hand, he knows things that no real – freshmen should know for instance when he's talking with jake at the party at jake's house uh after everyone leaves and carolyn's passed out in the bedroom uh farmer ted is making martinis 
and he's using the shaker and that stuff. They don't even reference it. It's just so natural that this freshman geek would just be making uh, himself and the senior some martinis. Yeah, and, and Anthony Michael Hall, also 16, as well as Molly Ringwald, but the other characters, Jake Ryan and the girlfriend, are in their mid-20s, like 24 and 25, and then Long Duck Dong is like 28 years old at this point. Getty Watanabe. Watanabe. Yeah, no relation to Ken Watanabe. Long Duck Dong <laughs> just nails it. As far as an Asian actor fitting right into all of our Asian stereotypes and making it so we can laugh at it is just classic John Hughes. It's funny because it's racist. Well, and you say, you know, Anthony Michael Hall is there as the as kind of the, the comedian, but that's I think that's what Long Duck Dong is. Long Duck Dong is, is there just as, uh, you know, for comic relief. Whereas I, I see Anthony Michael Hall more as there as to develop the story more with Samantha, where she's pining away for the, the super cool guy, but in her mind, the only one who wants her is the super dork. Um, so I saw it really playing as, as that way, is, is to, to develop uh, Samantha's angst at 16 in juxtaposing those two. Well, we know that John Hughes pulls a lot from his, from his childhood when he writes things. So vacation was kind of based on his family vacations that he took as a kid. I'm thinking since he's from a rich, white Chicago suburb, that when he did see the foreign exchange students come into these families, they were slaves. <laughs> <laughs> that could very well, uh, that could very well be. I mean, this poor guy, he, he nails his part, but we, we've seen him in other roles after this. I like, mean, he was in Gung Ho. Gung Ho. Uh, he has that short He was in thing. Gung Ho, the television series. <laughs> Gremlins, Gremlins 2. Gremlins 2. Gremlins 2. <laughs> but every time you see him, don't you yell out loud, that's Long Duck Dog. <laughs> yes. And I think he's still playing that. I mean, he still will show up as, when they talk about 16 Candles, they, they can always bring Gede Watanabe to do, you know, Oh Sexy Girlfriend or... I've never been to a something. 16 Candles convention. Is that what happens? <laughs> yeah, you they can't. You get don't the have big, to. You lived it. They can't get the big stars, Molly Ringwald and Anthony Michael Hall. To come. <laughs> uh, Anthony Michael Hall's in Dark Knight. And... <laughs> oh, yeah. He's, <laughs> he's got a big part in Dark he's Knight. He's the linchpin in Dark Knight. <laughs> Why do you think that this movie is more, I'm going to say more popular now than when it was when it first came out? I don't know if it's more popular now. I think it, it got its due when it came out on video. I mean, that's why we even saw You're it. You're wrong, Patrick. Oh. It's more popular now. Damn it. <laughs> I do think it's, po it's more popular now or after the fact. I think it's more respected now than it probably was at the time. Well, cer it certainly plays real. I mean, th these characters are real. I mean, the fact that they picked two 16-year-olds to play the main characters. John Hughes has the knack of hitting real what high school is really like those experiences in 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 the the kid coming in and and the friends trying to trying to defend him and say look you need to move on you need to get out of here and he's yelling back at her not nice manners babe i mean that's that's what that annoying kid would do and, and so i think it hits that it also hits on teenage angst i mean he gets in the head of a 16 year old who the world revolves around them and so even though all this is going on with the sister and, and and the marriage and all these all these things in in her mind that sixteen year old birthday and the fact that her boobs might grow in is the most important thing in the world and so he does a movie about specifically that. I like how you work boobs in almost every podcast. I'm I was interested in looking at this film as, to see it as PG. You know, this is before PG thirteen. Dreamscape, I think, is the first PG-13 film, right? We only know that because we get to the movies very, very early, and it was one of those trivia slides. Yes, yeah. it was the first PG-13 movie. But it's PG... Which one was the first PG-13? Dreamscape. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 16 Thank Candles for confirmation. is PG, and yet has a nude scene, has a boob scene, and drops an F-bomb, which kind of tells you the difference between PG movies in, in the early 80s and then PG, certainly now which a PG movie anymore seems like a kid's movie. And it might be one of the reasons why they did PG-13. I mean, we have no idea what goes on behind closed doors, but this could be one of their examples of parents being upset. Well, it's the summer of 84 is where everything got, you know, you had Temple of Doom, you had Gremlins, 
they, they probably use this. As I don't example. remember boobs and gremlins. No, but they, because of some of the gore and violence. Now, Ghostbusters wasn't so bad, but I know Temple of Doom was one of the big outrages at the time, the saying that it was an R, but it wasn't quite PG. There was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of, you know, the monkey brains and pulling the heart out of the guy's chest. That's why they got PG-13 the next year, and this probably... This probably was one of their arguments for it, too, because I was surprised. I, I remember the boob shot, and I am remembered as a PG, but I was surprised when she, she dropped the, they fucking forgot my birthday. And I was like, they they use the F word. They don't do that in PG, th- or PG <laughs> movies. They hardly do it in PG-13 movies. It's hard to, re- it's hard to forget the boob scene because he, he accompanies it with... It's hard for a some sound people. effect. A sound effect. I mean, how many... It's so gratuitous because it really isn't necessary. But then... They make it even more gratuitous by adding the boy. It's it's the yeah. best moment in the film. <laughs> without this a, was the year that. of of gratuitous nudity in PG movies, though. You had the bounty, which I think was the same year. Oh yeah, I forgot that was. But that and, was, I, and I guess that, that was, was done in a historical context. Oh, right, it's the National Geographic uh, <laughs> nudity, That's nudity, cool. which none you know, of those girls, the teenage boys, were lined up to go see the bounty. In National Geographic. But this, but yeah, everyone go 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 stream ba- the bounty apparently. <laughs> and then and then the mother load, the mother load of PG naked is Sheena with yeah, Tanya Roberts. Absolutely. The, the Motion Picture Association of America, they just must have been all high. Or just a bunch of old European guys. They're just like, yeah, what are these Americans so uptight about with nudity? When you said mother load, I thought you were referring to the pornographic movie. <laughs> I don't know if there is one, but that sounds like a good title for one. <laughs> that was the Back to the Future porno. <laughs> now, because I did play this for my, my my kids watch it because it was PG. How does a seven-year-old react to that? <laughs> yeah, my seven-year-old <laughs> laughed her ass off. And all she would say, she kept saying, they go, boing, 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 boing. <laughs> Now, what about some of the other family members that they show in 16 Candles? I mean, are they as believable as, no. as the kids? Well, the grandparents are over the top, and that's kind of a typical John Hughes thing to have, you know, overbroad characters, especially grandparents. I do laugh that Grandpa Fred's always thinking up the bathroom. <laughs> Right, I, I mean, and then and then you wonder is this is this how Samantha at sixteen perceives them? Is this is is John Hughes do, using like a little device, a little trick, and and she's seeing them as being these over the top? And d- does Grandma really say, "Oh, she's getting her boobies," you know, or, or is that just something that Samantha sort of imagining? I I don't know, but. Greg takes it to the next level. <laughs> I like it. But they are over the top. But I do like Paul Dooley as her dad. No, I thought he, he yeah. plays a very small, understated role. He's a wonderful actor. I would say one of the best scenes in the film, as far as like emotion, is that when she's talking to her father in the living room when she's on the couch and kind of explaining what's going on, and he's trying to understand and ha- having that difficulty relating to her. So. Well, and even at the very end where... He she takes off with Jake Ryan finally in his car and and yeah. shows him that's the yeah. guy I'm that's talking the guy about. I'm gonna go have sex with right now. That's yeah exactly. And the dad kind of gives an okay, you know. But I could see an adult a, a parent saying, "Look, yeah, you can skip out on the reception because you're this this guy is being nice and wants to take you out." Whatever. I I don't. I I found both of those scenes are actually my least favorite scenes of the movie. Really? Because at that point, heartless bastard. I am heartless. I go what. What 16-year-old talks to her father like this? Well, I mean, it, again, this is maybe Chicago, rich, white suburbia that is kind of alien to me. But she's just talking about a guy that, that she likes. I, I, I see that as having a conversation, having those conversations with your parents about this is a girl I like or this is a guy at, I at like? 16, yeah, at absolutely. 16, the, the heart of get the hell out of my, my life, parents. I'm, I'm an adult. I'm an individual. Yeah, why not? I, I just find it unbelievable. I had, a, I had a more secure growing up environment than no. you did, apparently. No, I the traditional teenage you know years where you you know want to be away from your parents, separate from them. I see that is that she's kind of having this almost this emotional release because she's had this shittiest of shitty days. Her whole family's forgotten her birthday, and he comes and apologizes, and he's making amends and has opened up to her about how he's wrong, and then she kind of opens up to him. That's how I read that scene. Or that's how I interpret that scene. It's not That may not be the normal re- day, everyday relationship she has with her father, but at that point in time when 
he asks, you know, is there something else wrong besides missing your birthday? She's just finally, she has to tell someone. You know. The one thing I did think it was interesting about that scene is that that comes in a portion of the film where Molly Ringwald's character just literally disappears other than that scene. I mean, that it becomes an Anthony Michael Hall story because we yeah, get... Yeah, and the wedding. The and wedding and... And, what? and and it should. Oh, oh, no, and it, it should. That's why I joked about him being the lead in this film is that from the moment he hits the screen... He has probably more screen time than Molly Ringwald does. She has that first introduction portion of it, but she disappears for a large chunk of the film. And I think that scene is, although I think it's important, you don't think it's important, is, is it basically it was a writer's tool to keep her involved, the, the audience. No, this is about her, you know, at, at that point in time, because then she disappears until the wedding. So. He's, but he's, it, was, it was about her because they had to have that time to develop Jake Ryan so you care about them getting together to show that, She's not just pining after this dude that's the popular, good-looking guy. They had to kind of develop him to try to be a likable character. And no. and so they do that through Farmer Ted, through the geek. But And you find out he's a really, really nice guy. He could have done her, his girlfriend, three ways from Sunday, all passed out. But he's not going to. He's no, not going to no, no. do that. He's, he's, he's going to feed he's her, gonna offer her to the geek. To someone else. And when she wakes up and says, who are you? He says, nah, that's me. So... Going to so it shows what a nice guy Samantha's getting ready to get herself involved in. So that was an important writing point. Uh, another thing that I, I think I know what's in the geek, <laughs> and I don't know if I'm pulling on my own personal geek experiences, but when uh, and I have a problem almost in in any sort of teen movie that comes out of Hollywood is they always have these huge, extravagant teen parties yeah. where the person with a million dollar home has 800 people there, they're trashing it, and it's just every... It, this is normal behavior, and everyone's fine. And, and hundreds and hundreds of dollars of alcohol. Right. I, I mean, you notice that no cops come to this party, and that's because there's no black people in this film. <laughs> um, yeah, but you are right. The, the the parties are always over the top. It's the, it's the mandatory. This is a very similar, again, a very similar scene, like the weird science party. Right, they have the weird science party. They have the some kind of wonderful party. I mean, these are, this is John Hughes. This should be the John Hughes party. Yeah, it's a John Hughes staple, just like Beatles songs and racial stereotypes. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but one character that, again, aside from the main ones that I laugh when I see her, and it's probably because she's handicapped in this film, is Joan Cusack. Yeah, she's yeah, good, good, good yeah. physical comedy. That's yeah. pretty much what she provides. Yeah, I mean, considering she doesn't yeah. say a word, I think in yeah. the entire film, she, she just says yeah. yeah, yeah. That yeah, the dancing scene with her is good. The the bus scene with Farmer Ted. And the only ones left on the bus is Molly Ringwald, <laughs> Anthony Michael Hall, and then a and neck Joan braced Cusack. <laughs> Joan Cusack. And they don't ever explain what the neck neck brace is, but because you don't ask, and it's the girl that no one else talks to. <laughs> Except the chubby girl at the dance who's like, oh, Dancing I'll dance with her. with her. And it's really difficult to drink from a drinking and fountain. And at the drinking fountain. And when she dabs her mouth with the, uh, the, dress. the dress of the shirt that she's wearing, I mean, that's great. Yeah. You have a, uh, you know, a good foreshadow in this movie when uh, Farmer Ted's in the, the Rolls Royce and he's driving down with Carolyn. And she's basically telling him... You can have sex with me if you want. And he breaks. He doesn't really break character. He breaks but he the breaks, fourth wall. breaks the fourth wall, looks right. into the camera, and starts talking. And we know that that was a big staple for another John Hughes Ferris Bueller movie. Right. Well, I, just, I like that Anthony Michael Hall, his, he's listed as the geek. That that's the name that they put as, as him. On one of the versions. Right. There's another version he's listed as Farmer Ted. Ted. Farmer Ted. I mean, my take was you you see the movie. He obviously he obviously steals a lot of the laughs in this movie. Or I, I'm not going to say steals, but he is the last of the movie, along with uh, Duck Dong. And uh, when people are referencing this movie, they they probably say, "Hey, I really like the geek." And people that they were talking to said, "Well, who's the geek?" He just says, "You know, the geek, the very hot, very hot." And they go, "That's Farmer Ted." They said, "Who?" Yeah, Farmer and, Ted. And they go round and round and round, and I think eventually they just said, well, it's easier just calling him the geek. Well, so so Farmer Ted, the geek, does does keep her panties, right? Because he has them 
at the end of the towards the end of the movie to gives them to Jake Ryan and to masturbate to. I mean, he gives them to Jake Ryan, yes, right. But he's only supposed to have them for ten minutes, so she takes off from the. From he became the, a businessman. I don't think <laughs> he understood how much money he was going to make by showing horny freshmen these panties in the dance bathroom. Right. She never got him back. That's all I know. That's, uh, she did at the end. Mm. It's slightly crusty. <laughs> That's a pretty weird part. I need your underwear for 10 minutes, but then I'm going to keep them. Uh, and that's the joke on you, uh, Damali. One other thing, because this came up when we were talking about this movie yesterday, was the uh, Matt's favorite scene, the boob shot, discussing of whether that was the actress or not. And we actually had to look it up. And it, and it wasn't the actress. It was actually a body double that, that played that, which you know I thought was kind of interesting that you know you – the, the actress wasn't well known. It's not like you you know signed a you know a, a major actress or she was twenty five. She yeah she was twenty five. So you're not dealing with an actress who's actually only you know sixteen or seventeen and can't do the nude shot. I, I thought that was an interesting you know choice for that particular role. That wasn't the actress. That was not the actress. Hollywood fucks you every <laughs> chance they get. Yes, 25 years of masturbation just down the drain. You don't know who you've been thinking about now, huh, Jason? Well, and, and it does beg the question, why did John Hughes cast her? Because right. the whole point of her is that she is a well-endowed 18-year-old or 17-year-old senior. And what's the line that Samantha or Randy has about, is it, is it Samantha, Molly Ringwald, about how she must have flunked nine grades right. to, to have a body like that? And then... They had to get a body double because apparently that wasn't she true. She didn't have a body like that. Very disappointing. I think that girl feels, the body double feels really good about herself. After Everything from the neck down is A-OK. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I, I like when, yeah, when she's going to try out. You, honey, the, the good news is you got the role. You got yeah. the role of uh, Carolyn, of Carolyn the, the girlfriend. Yeah. Bad news is it's just her boobs. Right. No, you get to see her ass, too. But when you do it, cover your face, please. <laughs> Well, you know, and it's interesting. We're trying to find out as who the body double was. I can't even can't find, find out. out. We can't find out who it was. It's if you're just, listening, <laughs> yeah, to the body double for there, sixteen. Camp. Please email us. Jason at, desperately needs a name for the, the Jason body. at lunchtimemoviereview dot com. Send a picture. Let us know where you are, preferably from nineteen eighty four. I like how suddenly I'm the guy who's all boob assessed. <laughs> Matt brings it up all the time. Patrick. At the end, brings it back up, but suddenly Jason's, it's me. It's, uh, you're the pervert. Right. When I was in the when in the early '80s, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh grade, uh, those PG-13s with boob movies were pretty important. <laughs> I like and that. here it comes again. Here comes the disclosure. <laughs> Email Matt at right and send him bottles of lube. <laughs> that was sixteen candles, and how we end every podcast is we kind of give our take of. When we first saw the movie, if we saw it in the 80s, did we like it in the 80s? And do we think it holds the test of time, and do we still like it now? Matt? I, I watched it in the 80s. I remember liking it, and I like it much more now. I appreciate the dialogue. I appreciate the, the life experiences better now than I did then. Uh, before, it was just kind of a quirky, funny movie, and I think I, I liked uh, the overt stuff, whereas now I like the, uh, I like the entire story, and I think it does a, a really good job. I still love... Uh, 16 Candles. Yeah, I liked it in the 80s. Um, I still really like it now. It's one of those movies that makes me want to own my own Chinaman. <laughs> I liked it in the 80s. I like it now. Uh, I, I think it it's a movie with a lot of heart and and good writing and, and funny moments. And as it, it's as funny and cute a movie can be that endorses date rape. <laughs> I saw it in the 80s. Uh, I really liked it in the 80s. I was actually quite surprised that I did not like it as much now as I did back then. Dark was, Side of the Moon! No, no, no. No, no, no. No, I actually still like the film, but it just didn't... It, it just... I, I still like the film. It just... It, it, does, it, it does appear dated to me. It just... It, 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 it does take me back to that era, but it, I don't think it would resonate as well with an audience today as it did back then. You know, you'd have to update it a lot. Of the John Hughes films, and I know we'll talk about them at other times. I think Breakfast Club is a better film that holds up, and maybe because they don't overrated. And I, I know that's what you think about it, but that appears more timeless because it's more encapsulating. Everyone's a stereotype. They don't, you know, it's over one day. You don't have this outside world kind of experience. I think Sixteen Candles is dated by 
Uh, don't get me wrong. I like it far better than a fish called Wanda, but uh, you know, I just I didn't like it as much. <laughs> And no. now that we've insulted everyone at the table, <laughs> send your hate mail to Patrick at. No, I. But here I want to clarify. I want. To, I'm interested in. So you're saying that, that that visually it's it's dated because it is because of the 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 clothes is the clothes are obviously from that time period. The music's obviously from that time period. Is that is that well, your floppy line? discs are from well, that no, time right. period? Well, it, but the no. story itself, I think, is timeless. I think the it, the, the teenage age. No, that, Marley Wingroll's far too old now. <laughs> The, the teenage angst, the, the idea that I'm pining after the, the, the cute boy from the, the 16. Uh, unreachable, to, una, una, yeah. unattainable. I'm coming into my own, in my mind as a 16-year-old, but not into my body. I mean, I think that is timeless, and I think the geek the geek thing is, is timeless as well. That's why I think those two are the main characters, because it does a good job showing these two awkward kids in their own experience. They ultimately you know conquer, I guess, high school eventually, because he gets to bone the uh, prom queen and... She gets to be boned by Jake Ryan. Well, uh, and but was I think there a question I in there because you started off that you had a question. <laughs> I just wanted to get to the bone, and then part. two minutes later, I'm still waiting. Yeah. So what? What is it that's not that that doesn't stand up? Is it just visually well, or the story itself? I, well, I, I do think the stories. You know, I do agree with you that the heart of the film is somewhat timeless. But I do think even even the character of the geek. You know, in, in this day and era, I think the the, the kind of the geek personality is more the people who would place themselves as, as categorize themselves as geek in high school now are probably more accepting of it and you know it is not since the you wouldn't be such the social pariah that he may have been at, at that time in the 80s because you know I grew up in the 80s and I would categorize myself as a geek and you know, especially during junior high you know I but there's being a geek and then there's being a geek and a freshman right. and so it's and, and a spaz he's more of a spaz than a geek he's right. a spaz right <laughs> And, and so he, he represents staff. so you know sort of just about what every freshman goes through who isn't a jock or you know really popular. And he's doing the same thing as Samantha differently. He's pining away to, for either the cool kids or for Samantha who is out of his league. Yeah, and except he's, he's doing it overtly, where she's kind of right instead of being shy and and well, and, he, he's popular among the freshmen. I mean, he's king of the freshmen, right? Especially after the panties, right? Ooh. I mean, he's gets this this rep in sixth grade, and so people do look up to him. I think it's that angst of coming to high school and trying to carry that reputation along with you. So timeless, you like it, but do you do you think it stands the test of time, Patrick? I, I think it's an entertaining film. I don't think it would be nearly as if you were to take it and show it to a teenage audience today. I don't think it would be it have that kind of appeal. I don't think it would resonate with them as well. I, for for what it's worth, my fourteen year old watched it and loved it. I don't know. If, yeah, what that, I, and what that, that does, says it, it might, it's certainly anecdotal, but it, uh, it, it doesn't surprise me because I I think there's a lot of timeless themes in there that you're always awkward during that age unless you have the life and the looks of the Jay Ryans and Carolyn's. Of, and Question I have, none of the John Hughes films have been remade by Hollywood yet, right? There's Not, not one has been remade. Do you think these get remade? And if so, what do you think the first one is they re, they try to remake? I would I would say probably 16 kids. This one? Yeah. I agree. I think, I think I it's, it's only inevitable before they do, right? No, I would say Breakfast Club. Hmm. I think they would try to, to make that again so you're saying they won't remake it because they're scared of touching this one absolutely i think it's it would it would fail miserably because you're going to go back to the performances of anthony michael hall and watanabe and it's just no one no one's going to be able to pull that off it's just a matter of time though right do we agree it's a matter of time before they start remaking john hughes films well yeah i I mean i do think they'll remake it i i disagree with you i don't think six i think the breakfast club is probably more beloved than 16 candles yeah. um and you know i think that's where that's the, why they'll remake it because it's more beloved you know i think this one's the one more likely that they could easily make breakfast club i think is it, you really would be rehashing i think 16 candles you can introduce something to um, you're definitely not going to have the little uh japanese slave anymore that jason's so fond of but you know oh, i don't know he'd be iranian <laughs> i don't think life has gotten any better for an asian actor Asian no, no, films no. in the just, 80s just did not fare well. Not, they still don't. Just ask the hangover. Oh, come on. Yeah. Joy Luck Club 2 is coming on. <laughs> well, that's it for today's classic episode of Lunchtime Movie Review. Please let us know what you think of the film in the comments section on our website and rate it from one to five stars on that page as well. 
If there is an 80s film you'd like us to review, please send us an email at comments at moviehousememories.com with your name, your pick, and your location. And finally, if you are of the social media persuasion, you can look the MHM Podcast Network up on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And if you do, please give us a follow when you find us. On behalf of the whole gang here at Lunchtime Movie Review, thanks for tuning in. And until next time, we have to get out of here, and you guys are invited. This podcast is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The theme song for Lunchtime Movie Review, Fireworks, is brought to you by Alexander Nakarada at SerpentineSoundStudios.com under a Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 license. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Lunchtime Movie Review, the MHM Podcast Network, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise, nope.